A few months ago, I was on an airplane. Now, this is remarkable in and of itself because I just don't travel as much as I used to. I mean, I used to travel a lot. In fact, my first real job had me traveling all over the country, two days per city, two cities per week, three weeks out of four. Let's say I earned a lot of frequent flyer miles. But things are different now. My life is different. The world is different. And so there I was settling into my aisle seat when my seatmate started talking. <laughs> now, despite rumors to the contrary, I am an introvert. I'm the guy on the plane with the headphones. I'm very obviously not available for conversation. <laughs> My iPad is up and playing a movie before we even push back from the gate. If I were a cartoon, there would be a big go away sign <laughs> flashing over my head. So imagine my surprise when my seatmate, seatmate tapped me on the arm, a hopeful look on her face. So I pause the movie, pull my earbuds out, and say hello. And for the next half hour, we talk. She is clearly a nervous flyer. And because I am, after all, a truly wonderful person, <laughs> I distract them. And it works because I am also tremendously entertaining. <laughs> but at some point, she asks me the, the question, so what do you do for a living? I'm gonna put aside for just a second how weird this question is in general, future sermon. Except to say that in my case, this question gets extra weird because I'm a minister and no one knows what to say to a minister. <clears throat> <clears throat> Usually, I can bridge this moment of su sudden revelation without anyone spontaneously combusting or confessing their sins. <laughs> Usually, and that's good because it could be really embarrassing, especially on a plane. But sometimes, like this time, things go differently. So, what do you do for a living? Me, I'm the pastor of a church. A moment of blinking then commenced and ended with a soft, oh. <laughs> and suddenly, I was back to watching my movie <laughs> for the rest of the flight. Look, I'm not an idiot, right? I'm aware that for the last 50 years and more, Willingly telling someone that you go to church tends to mean something very specific. And that is because the moral majority, the prosperity gospel and Christian fundamentalists really have done a number on the American psyche. And as a result of their work, I know that there is now a huge and growing part of the American population that draws conclusions about people who go to church. And if you read the news, if you read it today even, you will realize quickly that those conclusions can be perfectly reasonable. And that's part of why I get uncomfortable talking about my job with strangers. Because when people ask me what I do for a living, I feel like I have to apologize. As author Lillian Daniels describes in her recent book, tired of apologizing for a church I don't belong to, my apology reflex springs from this massive weight of history and our current cultural climate. It's no surprise that some folks recoil from religious people. I get it. And so sometimes I do apologize. Sometimes I even try to explain. You know, I know what you've heard, but that's not me. Yes, I know what you've heard, but that's not my church. Yes, I know what you've heard, but that's not who we are. Yes, I know what you've heard, but we're different. 
And sometimes I can almost smell the confusion, the suspicion. And I understand their reaction makes a lot of sense. Yes, stranger on the plane, I am clergy and I completely understand why you suddenly don't want to talk to me. But like Lillian Daniels, I am tired of apologizing. Why should I have to apologize for a church that doesn't hate people? Not women, not children, not gay people, not queer people, not trans people, not black people, not immigrants, not foreigners, not outsiders, no hate for anyone at all. Why should I apologize for a church that doesn't tell people how bad they are? No hellfire, no damnation, no original sin, no love the sinner and hate the sin, no depravity is human nature, none of that toxic malarkey. Why should I apologize for a church that cares about making the world better, showing up for justice, pushing the arc of human history upward, onward, forever? Why should I apologize for a church that celebrates wholeness and growth, bettering ourselves, bettering our world of caring, of engaging, of connecting? Why should I apologize for a church that welcomes the stranger, welcomes the doubter, welcomes the questions, and agrees not to judge but to love, to walk together even and especially when we don't agree. Why should I apologize for a church that tries, that gets it wrong, laments when we fall short of our ideals and aspirations, and then recommits to trying to make it right? Why am I apologizing for a church I don't belong to? If you've ever visited the South, you'll know that there are three questions a Southerner will ask you. The first is your family name. The second is about your occupation. The third, anybody know? What church do you go to? Seriously, not kidding. It's like they all got the same memo installed the same subroutines, have the same pheromonal reactions. I don't know, name, job, church, that's how you are known. But no Southerner, nor anyone else for that matter, no one has ever asked me why I go to church. It's like the question doesn't even make sense to say out loud, definitely not in the South. But today, as a minister, as a pastor, as a priest, it's worse. Given my new profession, I think it's odd that no one wants to know why I went to church all those years ago. So I'm going to tell you now. <laughs> the answer is actually kind of sad. Truth is, I wasn't looking for truth and meaning. I wasn't particularly concerned about practical goodness. I didn't care about God. Truth is, I was lonely. This past May, the Surgeon General issued a report about the epidemic of loneliness. Loneliness. People, we are in a pandemic. Perhaps it was made worse by our pandemic. Perhaps it was made worse by social media. But whatever the cause, whatever the accelerator, the conclusion <clears throat> is we are in trouble. From the report, quote, loneliness is far more than just a bad feeling. It harms both individual and societal health. It is associated with a greater risk of cardiovascular disease, dementia, stroke, depression, anxiety, and premature death. The mortality impact of being socially disconnected is similar to that caused by smoking up to 15 cigarettes a day and even greater than that associated with obesity and physical inactivity. And the harmful consequences of a society that lacks social connection can be felt in our schools, workplaces, and civic organizations where performance, productivity, and engagement are diminished." End quote. I wonder how many of you 
here today would agree with this. How many of you would say, yes, I am disconnected. I am isolated. I am lonely. I wonder how many of you feel it, but will wait to say it. Wait until you're alone. Okay, thought experiment time. Imagine you're 20 years old. <sighs> Try to remember how many friends you had back then. When I was 20, I had an enormous circle of friends. Of course, I was in a fraternity, so clearly I'm cheating. But at 25, I still regularly hung out with about three dozen people. I had to think about it, but yeah, three dozen. It's a big circle. But by the time I was 30, that circle was down by half. Marriages, moves, jobs, kids, life, lots of reasons for that trim down. Makes sense. By the time I was 40, I had maybe half of that again. Just four other couples that my wife and I did things with regularly. I was in full career mode. The kids were tiny. We were exhausted. By the time we turned 50, that circle had shrunk again. Divorce, more moves, the first deaths, increased job pressure, some jo new jobs, some new careers, some new connections, yes, but not like the old. Today, of that circle of about 35 people I used to hang out with, I regularly now only talk to about three. At this rate, well, I actually don't really want to think about that. But at the, some point along my journey, my wife and I uh, fully realized this path that we were on, the path that our parents had been on, the path that too many of you are on. For the record, our realization happened in our early 40s. We knew that we needed to do something to add to this mix of middle life, something that might help us rebuild what we were losing along the way, what everyone loses along the way. We needed community, we needed a connection, we needed friends. And that's why we started looking for a church. My wife made me go. <laughs> yes, made me. Our twins were little, and she said that she needed to remember how to adult. And also, she really wanted to sing. She used to sing professionally. Did I, tell you, did I ever tell you that? Yeah. I'm married to a rock star. <laughs> don't ask me how that happened. I honestly don't know. But I will refer you back to some earlier comments about how wonderful and funny I am. Anyway, off to church we went. The first one we tried didn't really fit us, so we tried a different one. It was nice, but they were way more into us than we were into them. I think I was asked to be a board member. It was not good. Uh, two strikes, uh, I was really done at that point. Uh, let the record show that it was my wife that then went to a local UU church, fell in love, and one Sunday she dragged me with her. Dragged. By the scruff of my neck, I was violently sh taken from the sweet and loving comfort of my comforter. <laughs> and the rest, as they say, is history. These days, I don't tell people that church is the answer to the loneliness that comes with living a life. Church is not the answer to the ache that growing up and growing old brings to each and every one of us. It is not the answer but it can be an answer. And to my vast and continuing surprise, it turned out that it was my answer. And wanting that, needing that, finding that, that is not something anyone should have to apologize for. This place is different. I know it, you know it, more and more of our neighbors know it. Why? Because you keep telling them. You tell them about this church that you visited, this church you 
belong to. You show them by being here. Even today, when going to church can be countercultural, you chose to be here and tell someone about it. You rebel, you. <laughs> but maybe that's because here you can bring your hopes and needs right along with your lamentations and your loneliness. You can bring your whole self, your broken self, your uncertain self, your lonely, quiet, hurt, and hurting self. You can bring your curious, questioning, doubting, untrusting, suspicious, cranky, cantankerous, rebellious self. And you are welcome here. Because there's a secret here. It's not well kept, to be honest. So it's kind of a crummy secret as secrets go. But the secret is this. Being here may not change the whole world, but for each of us, it can change our whole world. Because the truth is we are better when we are together, even if it's not perfect, even if it isn't everything it could be or should be or will be. We are still better when we are together. And we can know that. We can trust that because when it comes to the particular and peculiar pandemic of loneliness, this is the prescription, according to the Surgeon General. This. So check that order of service. Check the weekly email. Check the website. Sign up with Laz for some practical goodness. Accept Lily's invitation to just come meet people have fun and make friends. Do all of that. And if you're nervous or feeling awkward or reluctant, just do it anyway. Because remember, you're just following doctor's orders <laughs> and the advice of the Surgeon General of the United States. Honestly, I should just drop the mic here and be done. But before I go, let me tell you this one last thing. My friends, this year, I want to make this year about something different. I know I say that every year, but this year, I mean it. <laughs> Our church is on a, on a journey of identity and purpose. Ten years ago, five years ago, even two years ago, we were different than we are today. And this year, my friends, as we re-kick things off the second week of our program year, I want you to remember why you're here. Tech team, uh, if you're listening, uh, can we bring our remote friends back into the space? Is that something we can do? We can, I love that. Friends, look around the room. <laughs> remember, I can see you. Yeah, feel free to wave. Wave to the people up on the screen. I love that. Turn and wave to each other even. Yeah. <laughs> This is why you are here. These faces, these people, your people, the premise and the promise of friends and friendship, community and connection and care, and that's it. That's the whole thing. That's the secret. And that is what we're about this year. Keep looking at those faces. We are not the same. We come from different walks of life. Different, we have different stories, different experiences. We are not the same, no. But perhaps we have the same goal. Perhaps it's this belief that being here matters, that being here is a choice that matters. Maybe by being here, by showing up, we are saying, even without the words, we are saying that we value each other, that we believe in each other, that we need each other. Being here is a choice to journey together, to quest together, to strive, to seek, to find, and not to yield, and to do that together. We come here to suffer the slings and arrows of outrageous fortune, and to do that together, too, here in this house of love and faith. Because being together means celebrating each other, challenging each other, holding each other in the light, and lighting candles for each other in the dark. 
being seen, being known, and being missed when we're gone. And that, at last, is where the truth lies. Or so I believe. Why I go to church. Why we are all here. It is, I believe, as Ram Dass taught us. All of this, community, friendship, church, life, it's not complicated. We just forget. We forget sometimes the big why of all of this. Just as we forget the reason, the purpose, the point of why we are so important to each other. We forget that we are not alone. And so we gather to be reminded that in the end, we are all just walking each other home. That is the church that I belong to. I will never apologize for it again. Amen. Visit us at uusg.org. <laughs>